Hello, brothers and sisters. God bless each of you, and uh, I know we're all uh, dealing with uh, the restrictions imposed on us by this uh, corona crisis, but nevertheless, we still serve a God who, uh, who loves us, we love Him, and we are grateful to uh, be allowed to continue to worship in His name. Uh, this is uh, Pastor Tommy Smith of the Palmasia Baptist Church, and I just want to bring with you uh, our, our word for today. This is uh, Sunday, uh, March 22nd, and indeed there is a word from the Lord. This is our uh, sermon time, and uh, for, this, for this sermon today, I want you to turn with me, those of you who have your Bibles, to uh, the uh, 13th chapter of the Gospel of Luke. There's some words there that we uh, wish to, uh, to read to start with. <clears throat> And, uh, and after we read these, uh, I'd like for you to uh, pause with me for a word of prayer. Uh, Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9 read, And now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were more guilty than all of the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year, and I'll dig around it and I'll fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. May God bless the reading, <clears throat> hearing, and responding to his word. Um, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer now. Father, we praise you and thank you for your mercy and love and grace. Thank you for your goodness, Lord God, and thank you, Lord, for blessing uh, all of us, Lord God, with life, Lord God, and with understanding, Lord, and help us, Lord, uh, to hear from your word today, Lord, things that will encourage us and equip us uh, to go through this period of crisis, Lord, and to yet honor and uh, praise your name. We thank you again for your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, the, the theme, the title that I have uh, selected for this sermon today is uh, COVID-19, Judgment or Coincidence? And uh, this coronavirus has upset things and caused us to uh, rethink several important aspects of our lives. People often wonder what is the cause of such negative or tragic things when they occur, and whether they just happen as a coincidence or, you know, whether they are actually a judgment from God. Now, we all know from reading scripture that from time to time, God did tell Israel in no uncertain terms that he, was, he would punish them for sinful behavior. And often these punishments involve pestilences. <clears throat> but the New Testament ushered in some changes. And as it says in John 1 and 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Through this and many other texts, I want to declare to you today the Bible's position on this question. This message will make it clear that God's judgment is often not the source of these types of events, but prayer to God can provide the deliverance from these calamities. Uh, to sum this up in a theme statement, I would say that we should not accuse God of being the author of our calamity, but he can certainly be its solution. Uh, let's just take a little bit of uh, context, uh, take a, a minute to give some background context for this. Now, uh, people have uh, for years uh, you know, struggled with this philosophical question of uh, you know, what is the reason for calamities uh, happening. Uh, they've often wondered, is there a connection between circumstances in life and moral behavior? And, uh, and there are different versions of this question. Uh, you know, sometimes it's posed in the form of, does evil always catch up with you? Uh, are bad things always the result of a judgment from God? And so forth. And there are many places in scripture where this topic is dealt with. Uh, the book of Job deals with it almost exclusively. That's uh, pretty much the whole, the whole uh, uh, topic there where, where Job's three friends are trying to convince him that uh, for him to have uh, received all of this bad luck and all of these negative things must be a judgment from God and therefore Job, you must be uh, hiding something. 
And Job uh, tried in vain to convince them that he uh, had not done anything to, uh, to warrant these things. But, but nevertheless, it, it is about that struggle and trying to understand that. Uh, the prophet uh, Habakkuk uh, dealt with this subject uh, somewhat. He was very upset that God would use a sinful people like the Babylonians <clears throat> to, um, to punish uh, Israelites, and he, he couldn't understand that logic, and so uh, that dealt with it. Uh, the book of Psalms deals with it, and, and uh, several of the Psalms pose the question about why do the wicked seem to prosper, and why do they seem to uh, get away with so much, and why isn't there this more of a of a balancing uh, and judgment when people do wrong. Uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes, I think, gives probably the most astute answer. <clears throat> and uh, his take on it in Ecclesiastes 9 and 11 reads as follows. I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. Now, this writer is saying that from his perspective, what he has seen is that there really is no causal relationship, per se, uh, between most events, and that everyone uh, is subject to time and chance. Uh, people still, however, persist in believing that there must be some cause preceding all negative events. A good example of this is in the ninth chapter of St. John, when Jesus and his disciples encountered a blind man. And the disciples were compelled to ask Jesus, why was this man born blind? Uh, did he sin or did his parents sin? And, uh, you know, they were coming from the position that for such a calamitous thing to happen to a person, uh, there had to have been a cause for it. Uh, maybe this was payback to something that his parents had done or maybe something that he did. Now, when you think about it, how could he have done anything and he wasn't born uh, unless they are speaking of some realm uh, before we enter this earth realm. That can, gets into a whole different kind of philosophical thing. But the point is that they felt that there had to be an answer to this, to this uh, dilemma. Now, what Jesus told them is that yeah, neither one, it was, it was neither event. Uh, this happened so that uh, this would be an opportunity for God to be glorified. And for all we know, that may be the case in many other things. But um, these verses here, Jesus deals with that question in, in, a, in a similar uh, sort of way. Uh, <clears throat> The first outline that I would suggest as we look at the uh, exposition of this, of these verses, is that in the first verse, uh, there's a question implied. Uh, they didn't outright ask a question, but they, they pointed out to Jesus that, uh, you know, hey, did you know that uh, Pilate uh, mingled the blood of these people when they were given this sacrifice uh, up in Galilee? And they may have mentioned this because Jesus had uh, just previously, in fact, in, in Luke chapter 12, Jesus was talking about uh, the fact that judgment can catch up with people. He said, if, you, uh, if you're having an argument uh, with someone, uh, settle it before you get to the courts because it could turn into uh, you know, ugliness and you could really wind up having to pay a high price. So they were perhaps suggesting that maybe uh, this event with these Galileans uh, could be an example of deferred justice. And, uh, and Jesus said no. Uh, and if we, if we go on to the, uh, to the next verses here, Jesus said, no, it's not that they were the worst uh, sinner. He said, you think that this happened to them because they were the worst sinners in that region of Galilee? And uh, he said, uh, not at all. In fact, uh, what he says here, I'm going to reread verses 2 through 5. He says, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Uh, or those 18 who died when the tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were more guilty than the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Now, and his, his point was simply this. He knows that they are thinking <clears throat> that when these, evil, when these events happen that are tragic and, and, uh, and upset our lives, uh, in order for the universe to be fair and in order for God to be just, something must have precipitated this. Something must have led uh, to this kind of thing uh, uh, happening. But Jesus doesn't want them to think that because, if, think about it, if, if you really think that, that every time a negative thing happens, it's because God is, is laying judgment on someone, then, then, you know, God winds up just being associated with just doing negative things and being, you know, the great, uh, the great policeman in the sky. And, uh, and, and that's not the point that uh, 
he wants to make. And that's why he gave the similar point about <clears throat> the tower falling on people. He says, uh, you know, it seems as though the people thought that the reason that this tower fell on these people was because they were, they were bad sinners and God used his divine uh, insight to orchestrate these people to all be in the right place at the right time for this tower to fall on them. But Jesus repeated the point. He said, it's not that they are the worst sinners uh, in this region. He says, but if you don't repent, you too will be likewise vulnerable to these kinds of things happening. That's what he said in both cases. It's not that these people were the worst sinners, but if you don't repent, the same thing can happen to you. And so uh, the real point that he's making here is that when, when, when we are unrepentant, uh, when we don't have a relationship with God and there is no special nexus between us and God, then we are just out there subject to the whims of whatever goes on. Whatever the forces of nature are, whatever the forces of coincidence are, we are subject to all of those things. And understand, uh, that's different from judgment. Judgment is a specific act uh, put in place to respond to a specific infraction. And God does indeed know how to uh, dispense judgment, but that's not what's happening here in these, uh, in these two events that these folks brought up to Jesus. Uh, that was not judgment for, uh, for wrongdoing. Uh, that was a, a case of them being uh, unprotected. This was a case in, in them being people uh, who basically were not being inter intervened for. Uh, because they were out there uncovered. And, and so what Jesus talks about, the point that he wants to make is that it's vulnerability, that we are vulnerable to the forces of nature uh, when we haven't done something to protect ourselves from them. And the something to protect ourselves from them, Jesus, uh, Jesus says it's, it's repentance. And then to make his point, he gives this, uh, this parable uh, to, to seal up the point he was making. And this parable is really about vulnerability. Uh, in, in verses 6 and 7, it says, Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I have been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? So this parable highlights the idea of being shielded uh, from the calamities through intercessory prayer. And Jesus characterizes this intercessory prayer as repentance. So let's look at a, a parallel between the, the fig tree and, and human beings. So the fig tree is living its life, uh, minding its own business, but it's not being productive. It is not achieving the goals for which it was planted. And this is how Jesus described human beings who, are, who have not repented. Uh, they are living their life. They are minding their business, but they are not producing what they were put here for to produce. The fig tree was put in that vineyard to produce figs. We are put on this earth to produce a level of righteousness and to interact with other human beings in a certain way. Now, after three years, this fig tree uh, had not produced figs, and it was clear that this fig tree was not on a pathway to producing figs. So therefore, the owner of the tree said, there's no purpose in this tree hanging around. It's just using up soil. Uh, let's go ahead and replace it with something that can do the job. Uh, Jesus, and in the, in the same way, when we apply this to humans, uh, after a certain amount of time with us not present, pr producing what God has uh, planted us for, which is righteousness, uh, then we too are subject to being just uh, cut down arbitrarily, just like this fig tree was getting ready to be uh, cut down. But what's beautiful about this is the idea of intervention is the idea of intercession. And that's what's, that's what's entered into, uh, what's introduced in these last two verses where the man sa says, uh, the gardener says, well, well leave it alone. Uh, let me have a year to work on it. And, uh, and then you can cut it down. Let's make sure uh, that if this tree is a failure, let's make sure that we've removed anything contributing to it being a failure. Let's sure we do all we can to facilitate its success. So, um, the tree was failing in its life mission, but the gardener acted as an intercessor to step in and save that tree. And, and here's the thing. If that tree repents, meaning if that tree changes its actions, 
then, uh, then it gets to live. Now, Jesus said for us to repent. Now, the word repent, uh, metanonia, means to have a change in mind. And uh, if, you know, trees don't have minds, so if a tree has changed, uh, then it's the only way you can know is by it producing different fruit. Well, human beings can say that they have repented, but really, uh, they too need to show some fruit. That's what, that's what John the Baptist told those um, uh, spiritual leaders a while back. He says, uh, if you're going to say you repent, then, then show some, some fruit that's uh, consistent with that. And so the, the spiritual message for us uh, from this parable is that um, the, the tree was, uh, was scheduled to run into a, a calamity. It was, it was scheduled to be cut down. But an intercessor came and uh, interceded on behalf of the tree and, and gave it an opportunity to change its ways, to repent and change its fundamental relationship with its, uh, with its planner, with its owner. Uh, and uh, the same thing has happened uh, with us. Jesus has come and he has interceded on behalf of us, giving us an opportunity to repent and make a relationship with God. And, uh, and, and if the tree does that successfully, then it will live. And the same is true with us if we are able to do it successfully. So let me, let me just take a moment and, and sort of uh, double click on that and make an application on that uh, for, our, for our day and time. Uh, these verses, I think, make a few points pretty clear. First of all, that, that everyone, uh, good and bad, is subject to random processes of time and nature some good and some bad. This is what the writer of Ecclesiastes said uh, when he said that, uh, you know, the race isn't given to the swift and the battle to the strong and so forth and so on. He said time and chance happens uh, to them all. And, you know, what, what actually does happen to us all uh, is the laws that God has put in place uh, to govern uh, this, this universe. Uh, God has things, uh, these things that are happening out here are not just happening uh, by, by happenstance. God has a, a well-ordered law uh, to, to have all of these things uh, in place. That's how he maintains order uh, in the universe. Now, some of, sometimes uh, you and I are hurt by uh, those things that have been ordered in, in the universe. And, um, and when things like that happen, uh, if we have a relationship with God, uh, then that means that God can come to our aid. Now, now, please understand this. Having a relationship with God does not shield us uh, from the structure and the order that God put in place. Having a relationship with God will not stop you from responding to the law of gravity if you step over a cliff. If you step over a cliff, you will fall down. Gra gravity will rule. Having a relationship with God will not prevent you um, uh, from from breaking a bone, if the uh, stress in that in that bone, if that bone's strength is not able to withstand the force of the blow that it hits, because God has put these laws uh, in place. Um, but what having a relationship with God will do is give us the opportunity to talk to God and and have Him intervene on our behalf because we have this relationship with Him. And so uh, having a relationship with God means that we have a means of intercession. Just like the gardener who stepped in on that tree's behalf, when we have a relationship with God, we can call on him. And we can call on him for deliverance out of that calamity. Now, God does not always respond in the same way to our cries for deliverance. Sometimes God does. Sometimes God delivers us entirely from the calamity that we're in. A good example of this is, uh, is when the apostle Peter was arrested uh, preaching the gospel. He was in jail one night. Uh, surrounded by soldiers, uh, held by two chains. God sent an angel to uh, release the chains and take Peter out of the prison uh, and keep all of those guards asleep while he was doing this. This was an example of God delivering someone uh, who had a relationship with him out of a calamity. Sometimes God doesn't deliver us out of a calamity. Sometimes God delivers us through the calamity. A good example of that is in the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel's three friends were threatened with being thrown into a fiery furnace. Uh, and they told the king, uh, you know, king, our God can deliver us if he wants to, but even if he doesn't, we're going to hold firm. Well, it turns out that they were put into the furnace, but they were delivered through the furnace. They somehow were not, uh, God suspended the laws of thermodynamics and allowed them to not get burned by that. God doesn't always do that, but he chose to on this occasion. Sometimes God uh, delivers us 
uh, from the calamity. Sometimes God delivers us through the calamity. And sad to say, sometimes um, God allows us to actually experience the full brunt of the, of the calamity. Uh, when John the Baptist was arrested by Herod, he sent a note to Jesus. He said, hey, are you the one we're waiting for? Because in case you haven't noticed, I'm down here on death row. I've done my job. I'm, I'm hoping for some kind of deliverance. Uh, but he, in fact, wasn't delivered. Uh, Jesus allowed John to actually be beheaded uh, in that situation. And so the thing to do is something, uh, and, 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 you know, God, God makes his decisions, doesn't always explain to us what his logic is. But the thing to do here is to not assume that if something bad has happened to you, that this is the result of God's judgment or the result of the enemy playing tricks. We, we should not make that assumption at all. Um, what we should do is if we have a relationship with God, we should call on him. We should ask for his intervention. We should ask for his deliverance. We should ask for his mercy. We should ask for him to, to come to our aid and, and, and to set us free. And he, and he may do it or he may take one of these other options that we have seen. But regardless of what he does, we can be confident in this. All that God does for us, he does with our best interests uh, at heart. Now, if you're a person who doesn't have a relationship with God and a calamity hits you, that doesn't mean that you can't, you can't pray. Uh, by all means, pray and ask God for deliverance. But here's the thing to keep in mind. Uh, God is not interested in just continually delivering people without them getting the fundamental message. It would be, <clears throat> excuse me, it would be very much like if you had a friend who wanted to borrow some money from you. They had a dire need to pay their rent or pay their car or something like that. And, uh, and let's say that you were generous enough and kind enough to, to, to bail this friend out uh, and they promptly used the money to party with or something like that and then called you up the next day uh, for a, another bailout and you gave them again. Well, imagine this happening five or six times and, and how thrilled would anyone be at that? And it's not necessarily that you would mind giving the friend the money. But what you really want is for them to learn how to manage their finances in such a way so that they're not always, uh, you know, up against the wall. This is how God is with us. God wants people, uh, God doesn't mind riding in on the white horse delivering us. But what God wants us to do is have that fundamental relationship with him so that we are living our lives in concert with his wishes and his desires. And when we do that, when we adopt God's, uh, God's will and God's viewpoint on things, then it's easy for us to see what happens in Romans 8, 28, where it says, and we know that in all things, God works together for good to those who love him, to those who have been called according to his purposes. And so uh, God's purposes for us, he created humanity. Uh, he planted us in his garden uh, to produce love, to produce uh, fellowship, to produce companionship. Uh, with one another. When we are not uh, producing these things, then we are just as vulnerable as that fig tree that Jesus talked about, about wanting to, to get, uh, get rid of. Now, uh, God was in a position to do that with humanity, but Jesus, as the gardener, stepped in. And what Jesus said to the Father was this, Father, uh, I know that humanity has been uh, uh, dropping the ball for a very long time, but but, but let's do this. Let, let me dig around. Them. Let, me, let me one more time. Uh, let, me, let me go at that tree and let me uh, really work with this tree. Let me work with the soil. Let me dig around all the weeds. Let me make sure that it has fertilization and let it, that it has nourishment. Let me make sure that it's receiving uh, sufficient water. Let me make sure that we have removed any and every impediment. That, that might stop it from growing and that we have given it every incentive to help it grow. And in fact, the most important thing of all, let me show them, Father, the clearest, uh, uh, most well-defined example of love possible. Let me show them what ultimate love is like in a clear and unmistakable way. This is how God has dealt with humankind. God has not dealt with humankind by uh, sending a team of angelic biomedical engineers to engineer a virus to be let loose in human society to cause humans to be weak and cause humans to cry out to him. That's not, that's not how God does things. That's not how he rolls. Um, but what God does do is use the calamities that we create uh, for our good. He doesn't have to create these, these calamities 
there, there are plenty enough ways that we do that ourselves. You know, we have created our, our global warming. We have created the pollution uh, that chokes so many of our resources. We have created uh, so many of the calamities. We have uh, unleashed things into the atmosphere and into human environment uh, that were not initially uh, planned to be there. We have done all of those things ourselves. But the thing for us to remember is that despite all of these things that we have unleashed on the planet, we can always call on God. We can call on him for his deliverance. We can call on him for his intervention, and he is able to step in. And so uh, what I would say uh, to all of us as a, as a challenge uh, during this time is to call on God and, uh, and to not make uh, just a change in our thinking, but a change in our actions. Go ahead and call on God and make a change not just in our thinking, but a change in our actions. Uh, one of the things as I, as I wrap this up, I, I, I'd like for us to think about our life here on earth as sort of a, as a, a dress rehearsal for eternity. This is a time when we really get to make it clear that we agree with God's will, that we want to follow his directions, that we want to live life the way that he wants us to or not. Uh, the, the fact is that whatever processes produce this virus, are going to produce other things. They're going to introduce other calamities into our lives. Uh, we cannot escape the dysfunction that we have caused on this planet that we have released in this earth. But what we can do is call on the Lord because we know that he can overcome all of these things that we get ourselves into. We know that God is able to do that and we know that God will, that, will do that because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And if there is anyone out there who is watching this video and you have not yet made your peace with God, you don't even need clergy to do that. You all by yourself can go to the Lord and let him know, Lord, uh, I repent for what I have done. I, I invite you into my life. And Father, I want you to save me. I want to start living life the way that you have intended me to. Amen. God bless you and keep you, and we'll see you next time. Amen.